And yeah, we're in uh, my cabinet shop and I've got Russ Foster here who has pioneered several things in land sailing. And today uh, we are cutting down a wing that I had and he is taking up a project he started about 30 some odd years ago and uh, it's going to be a wing boat and we're cutting down a, a larger wing to fit this new wing boat with a smaller platform and um, anyways Russ has pioneered several things in land sailing and uh, one of them was the Frito Bandito which was built in what 1969? 70, 70. Was, yeah. and anyways it had what the uh, monohull AC boats have as a double luff uh, sail and he has come at that time from a uh, C-class catamaran background and they used those in that so he passed it through to the land sailing and Russ how did that uh, how did that rig work it, it, it worked pretty darn well on a C-class cat, mm -hmm. and it, we used a six-inch diameter uh, irrigation pipe with some uh, things where, uh, for awnings uh, to put the sails up on, the, some extrusions, and um, that worked pretty well for the, the guys who had it. Uh, that's where I first saw these things was uh, on uh, the C-class cats. And then when we put it on the land sailor, we... Um, we wanted to do a couple of things. One was to uh, try to go well in light airs mm -hmm. at El Mirage Dry Lake. And mm -hmm. then the second was to be able to, to, to do that, we wanted to use leech wires that would compress the battens and change the shape of the sail by compressing the leech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, the vehicle, uh, when it was first in, uh, invented, uh, it was very light, it didn't have a good, very good traction, and so the little tiny uh, desert darts um, we could beat them in light air, but they could come storming by us <laughs> in the heavy uh, yeah, yeah. wind known as uh, dart weather. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dart wind. <laughs> dart weather, which that's... was like 25 and above at El Mirage. Wow, that's a, that's a yeah. lot of wind. Uh, and then your uh, second endeavor was uh, uh, started out as a, a boat for your kids called the Soup. And uh, it transformed into a pretty big class in the uh, early 70s at, in uh, the land sailing uh, community. And uh, ha when did you make that? that was, I think that was in about 1972. And it was indeed a little two seat. Uh, rig made out of exhaust tubing that would fit by adult, an adult and a child, mm -hmm. two ch children, and mm -hmm. it had started out with tiller steering because my daughter was much <laughs> taller than my son, who was at the fine force of four or five. Yeah. Um, and then, um, not being a very good governor of a one design class, I just sort of let people innovate it. I put out some plans for it, but people oh. mm -hmm. began making the platform bigger. They began putting bigger sails on it, and it became a in a, in a fairly short period of time. It became a, a you know kind of a development class. Yeah, and and who I know you you made yours I think out of all uh, metal, and uh, yeah. later on was it George Olson or, or uh, Wayne Coker that made the uh, kind of a cowling on the deck out of fiberglass? I think it was George Olson. Uh -huh. I'm not sure. And George Olson and maybe Alan Norton. Mm -hmm. And then that became. That morphed into a fully um, composite soup out of, out of fiberglass, Correct. soup body. Right. And the the the, the uh, masts became, uh, I think, Sparcraft 104 sections. There, there was some one design features of it mm -hmm. early on, but mm -hmm. then after a long time, it started to get <laughs> a development class. Yeah, speed is greed sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then your, your next endeavor, uh, <clears throat> let me go backwards, uh, a fellow named Wayne Coker uh, dabbled with a, a solid wing on a 
land sailor uh, controlled very much like how uh, Richard Jenkins controlled his uh, wing on uh, Greenbird with a what do you call that a delta flap or something like that or a yeah it was it's like a big windmill uh, a, a, a tail what do you call it a, a, a tail uh, angle of attack thing that sticks yep. out from yep. the back of a, of a uh, windmill and um, Wayne's was really innovative for that time I don't know it was 35 years ahead of when Richard did it and um, it it was amazing in that it could you could <laughs> we could have fun with it because the, the sail was a cantilevered on a, on a full rotating mast that could, or, or a full rotating spar that allowed it to rotate 360 degrees. So you could f do a reach past camp. And if you want to throw it in reverse, you just throw it into reverse with this tail that made the angle of attack of the, of the uh, main element um, go the other direction. Mm -hmm. It was fun. <laughs> That's pretty and, cool. But it did um, <clears throat> have some instabilities. And um, that and it made Wayne disgusted when it wreck, wrecked his car. But I thought it was a really, really way ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. Way ahead mm -hmm. of its time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then from that, I'm assuming from the C class catamaran. You were the first one to successfully build a wing boat with an external flap, what we see a lot today in um, the America's Cup boats and the Sail GP boats and land sailing. And you've actually been kind of the, um, <clears throat> how do I put it, the first guy to come out with that that, that uh, influenced many, many others, including myself, to get into wing boats. And uh, your first boat was called what? A Flatlander. Okay, yeah. And uh, first, my first and only wing boat. Uh huh. And um, that boat was uh, class four. Yes. Which meant it had uh, around fifty-nine square feet of wing area. And the external flap was what about? 20 or 30 percent 30 percent of the total uh, court. <laughs> mm -hmm. and w what influenced you to do like the sections and section shapes and and parameters on that boat well it, you know I, I i had a, a hunch that these things would be as good or better on the in craft with higher um apparent winds than catamarans correct yes so I, I was a little unaware, though, of what to do from a shape of the uh, sail or the shape of the of the, of the uh, airfoil section. So it just happened that my next door neighbor up in the Santa Cruz Mountains in Los Gatos was the head of the 14-foot NASA Ames um, th wind tunnel. Oh wow! And was a hang glider uh, a competitor himself, and was interested in the project. So he. He chose the section, which was a fairly well-known um, NACA section of, a, of a, in the 64 series airfoils, which is, it was a fairly thin section, 15%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, it had a fairly sharp nose on it, which mean that you had to really trim it pretty carefully to avoid stalling it, but it, but it worked fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I was shocked by how fast it was. and. Um, didn't know what it would turn how it would turn out, but mm -hmm. it got second place in the America's Land Sailing Cup in its class. And the first year I brought it out, and then for the next three years I was able to win the the national championship in that class four. So that's really impressive. It's really a, a neat little thing. And then I had several 10 and 11 year hiatus from, hiatuses from land sailing, and I, I was gone from 1985 or so 
86 until maybe 10 years later. So by that time, people had done some really good things with these, and including you and Phil Rothrock. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think you influenced Chauncey Griggs as well. Uh, I'm sure oh, you're, Chauncey, yes. you were the first, yeah. first guy to successfully pull it off, and yeah. then uh, the rest of us kind of followed your lead and made incremental improvements as we went. Definitely, but, uh, it's definitely advanced. As yeah. I, have seen from working with you today <laughs> on this wing cut down. Mm -hmm. So it's a far more refined. Uh, I didn't have really fully control of the mainsail because I had a little three-part mainsail, typical or little part three-part main sheet. And now, for many years, you guys have had a very positive sail control. Right. With uh, things and, that have made it, I think, a little bit safer too. And another thing too that you did that was interesting is quite like what. Um, the America's Cup uh, boats did is they segmented their flaps in different sections so they could um, and do, uh, allow it to twist off. And you did the same thing on Flatlander, correct? Yes. And so you were way ahead of your time there. And did that did that system work for you, or was it not yeah, noticeable? Well, or it, it helped a lot in in starting in light wind. Really. Because huh. the, the, even even in the uh, even with an only a 14 foot high mast, mm -hmm. there was a differential in the wind velocity from the top to bottom. Correct. Even in a little tiny mast like that. Mm -hmm. But on land sailors and ice boats, once you get going, the vehicle speed is by far the biggest component of, the, of the, any apparent wind you have, and of course the vehicle speed is equal all the way up the mast. So it was it was only helpful in light winds mm -hmm. and starting and then I would sheet it in and make the the uh, the flap almost untwisted correct right first. once you got going because uh, the percentage I think I figured out some of the vectors and it's like two or three percent different uh, angle of attack up on Especially top and bottom the faster you go it gets less you go, yeah the vehicle speed takes over as yeah. the big component yeah of the yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting and it makes one wonder on like Sail GP, they really, really unfold those flaps and let them twist off. But I have a feeling that when you foil, you need a ton of power when you're, before you foil. And then once you're foiling, they have too much power. <laughs> That's my guess. And they have to just let it, let that power go, let it bleed off on the top. Well, those are, yes, and those are tall rigs. Very tall, yeah. And it's really interesting to me. I don't know why the uh, foot of those um, uh, sail GPs is smaller than the midpoint of the sail. I don't know whether it's to it's aer it's an aerodynamic efficiency or it's whether to get mo a lot of the crew around the aft end of the sail. That could be both. Yeah, could so, be both. Yeah. But uh, I know the planform shape looks like it should, but uh, but to get the crew to run around and that's kind of a dangerous thing there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got to take a break. Yeah, we're out by Russ's trailer here, and he started this other wing. Uh, over 38 years ago and it's been sitting in storage in pieces and he's just got the inclination to start it up again and uh, so we cut that other little wing that uh, big wing down to fit this platform which will be a Fizzly 3 platform and uh, what thickness is the aluminum on there the, the main tubes are only 50,000 small yeah. inch tubing. And he made all these cool fittings because it's too thin to weld and they all insert in here into these steel fittings. And I um, imagine this thing's going to be super duper light. And also, as you know, John, it's been hard ever to weld aluminum to steel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be a bit, that would be a bit of a problem, wouldn't it? But, yeah, this is going to be pretty cool. And uh, so it's going to be a Fizzly 3 platform. 
um, and uh, I think he plans to race it in Fizzly 3. And um, it's kind of similar to the Flatlander in a, in, a, in a few ways, but he's going to cover it with like an airplane cloth. Airplane cloth. Yeah. So it should be super duper light. And uh, anyways. It has, the, it has the sail control system for angle of attack that you and Phil Rothrock mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. yep. pioneered. And okay. So I'm definitely copying that. It's a really good well, Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't mess up. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, Russ, thanks for your time. You're really And uh, hopefully we'll see this on the dirt soon. <laughs> hopefully. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.